So, we begin with this question. How can Passover, how can keeping Passover make church members weaker? No tomatoes. Okay, that's good. I expected to get some tomatoes. But essentially, it sounds crazy, but it is what Paul said and wrote and God edited it into the Bible. 1 Corinthians 11.30, for this reason, he's writing a letter to all of us for 2,000 years, but he's writing a letter to the Corinthian church. He's saying, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And I put the, the Greek words in there for you. And so it reads, many are weak, meaning strengthless. If you look at the Greek definition, the primary meaning is strengthless. Do you, have you ever seen any Church of God members strengthless? Well, back in the worldwide days when half of the church just went with Sunday, they were strengthless. Most people learned their way into the worldwide Church of God by studying the scriptures and proving the Sabbath and proving the Passover and proving the holy days. And the pastor general got up one day and said, you don't have to keep Sabbath. You don't have to keep holy days and completely turn the church upside down and half the church went in that direction, went to Sunday. It's like, that can't happen. I'm sorry, it did happen. Okay, the next little bit, and sickly. And the definition there is infirm, sick. All right, and then the third thing is, and many sleep. All right, so... I looked up the definition for that. The primary definition is, is put to sleep. How many of you have put to sleep a dog or a cat? Yeah, it's a horrible experience. You know, but that's the definition of this word. Now, reading all the definition, it says to slumber. So, okay, so, you, you know, people, people got sleepy. But it's not bad to be sleepy. Spiritually speaking, it's not bad to be physically sleepy. Spiritually speaking, it's very bad to be spiritually sleepy. So it can either mean you're spiritually asleep, or it can mean you were put to sleep, you're dead. People have died, right? And I'm going to leave it up to you to decide which one you like, or you can like both, whatever. But, you know, that's the definition, and that's, you know, why would he go, many of you are strengthless, Many of you are sick. Now, the Corinthian church, Gentile church, but Paul had taught them, and they were doing a potluck meal like Jesus had the, first, the Old Testament Passover lamb meal, like we have Thanksgiving meal. You all know how you feel <clears throat> at the end of eating a turkey meal. You get to the point where you just can't eat anything else, right? So... So that was the meal that Jesus was having with them before he introduced the New Testament Passover, which is the bread and the wine, and he introduced the foot washing. So, but in Paul's case, he had taught the Corinthians how to do it right, and then he'd gone on to another church, and then he heard that some of the Corinthians were getting drunk at the Passover. And we can't imagine people coming in drunk to the Passover. Now, you know, I've been to a number of... Um, visitations, and a number of funerals in the last year. And we can't comprehend memorializing the death of a loved one and having somebody come in drunk and loud and abusive. It, it's like, that just is not right. It doesn't fit. You know, and they were doing it. So Paul needed to write a very strong letter, and he explained to them he didn't make it up. It was like, this is what has been happening because you haven't been drawing strength from Passover. You have drawn weakness from Passover. So, you know, it's always good to have both sides of the coin. If you're only shown the bright, shiny stuff and you're never shown the danger, like teaching a child not to put the hand over the flame on a gas stove, you've got to, you know, you've got to help people know both sides of the coin. So he explained the church in Corinth, that they had some major problems. And this wasn't the only major problem. <laughs> if you go slowly through the, the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians, they had major problem after major problem. 
and they were just in sad shape as a church. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, for about 40 years of my 50 years around God's churches, I was never quite satisfied and never quite sure in my mind as to what an unworthy manner meant. And I have talked to people over the years who said, I just don't feel worthy to come to Passover. And so then I looked up the dictionary. It doesn't mean that at all. If you look there in your notes, it, the primary meaning is irreverently, right? The difference between in an unworthy manner is like, well, I don't feel worthy. Well, nobody is ever going to feel worthy to take Passover. That's not the point. The point is, don't take it carelessly or irreverently, right? Or like being drunk at Passover, which we would never dream of, you know, primarily because we, over the years, we've learned a very sober approach to Passover. So I, I love to look up the thesaurus because it expands on the thinking. And uh, essentially, reverence, the opposite of irreverence, is respect. Right? We try to do that at Passover. Admiration, love. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And this is the one time in the year that we come and we reverentially you know, adore. And, and OK, more words, approval, approbation, esteem, awe, fear. Veneration, honor, devotion, adoration, which they had gotten to the point of there was very little of that in their Passover service. Some were drunk, some were hungry. The whole thing was a mess. It was just totally missing the point. And he said, from now on, no more eating supper at Passover. If you're hungry, eat your supper at home. When you come to eat, which you'll find in the text, eat, eat, eat what? That tiny wafer of bread. That's what you come to eat, not your supper, tiny wafer. So he, you know, he's setting it straight. The opposite attitudes were careless or casual or drunk at the Passover. So he came down heavy, and it's a real blessing that we have this because we get the primary meaning of Passover in what he wrote. It's to remember the Lord's death to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we're just a tiny group of people, and the rest of the world doesn't interview us, it doesn't talk to us on TV, say, now, why is it you keep Passover? But we keep Passover alive and have done, you know, Church of God members for 2,000 years until he comes. And we don't know how many more Passovers there are will be until he comes. But it could be within a five, seven, ten year period, in which case Passover is totally different, right? It'll, it'll still have much of the same theme, but we'll have the living, all-powerful King of Kings, Lamb of God, on earth, visible. You think that'll change your Passover a little bit? That, 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 should, that should strengthen it up a whole bunch, right? Um, so it's not about how you feel, whether you're worthy or not of Christ. It's about doing, not doing it carelessly and doing it with much concern of how we have been serving the Lord Jesus Christ for the last 364 days. It's, it's our marker point for the next year. It's our reaffirmation of our covenant. When we baptized, we said we accept the new covenant in the blood of Christ and we accept serving you as our Lord and Master for the next 12 months until the next Passover. Paul says the beneficial way to take the Passover is with a reverent, not an irreverent attitude. In a, in a kingdom, <clears throat> in the second resurrection, I want to get a whole bunch of these translators together in a room. I want to knock some heads together. Because when it said the definition is irreverent. Why did they ignore the definition and put in an unworthy manner? Now, there's a similarity, but it's like a real weak similarity compared to irreverent. 
right? And, and it's pretty hard to misunderstand the word irreverent. Verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy, irreverent manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Wow! What is the deep meaning behind that? We really don't want to know. Because if you're taking it reverently, you don't really have to worry about the other side. Right? And if you're taking it casually, it's, it, you know, those people need to turn it around and get it straight. And, and we, you know, we have for 40, 50 years of my experience, we have taken Passover very seriously and very soberly and never let it get into a party, drunken attitude. Um, you know, maybe somebody else has. But some people eat lamb, you know. So they have a big lamb meal, I guess. But anyhow. So verse 28, but let a man examine himself. This is the best approach. This is how to be on the safe side of things. Examine himself. Definition I've got there in the handout says to test, to discern, to examine, to prove, to try. Reflect on your life for the last 364 days and, and whatever the answer is, grade yourself. My daughter is always grading papers for her students. You know, what, whatever grade you give yourself, go, man, I want to do better next year and come to Jesus and say, you're my starting point for another 364 days, and I need your help to do better, if that's how you graded yourself. If you, if you feel like you've done all you can do, or almost all you can do, and yeah, and then say, Lord, I want to do a little better than I've been doing. I don't have a lot of strength left, you know. So we should test ourselves asking, am I striving to serve Christ to the best of my abilities? And he's happy if people bear 30-fold fruit, which we probably wouldn't be if we were grading the test, and he's happy if they bear 60-fold fruit, which is a whole lot better than 30-fold fruit. And of course, he's very happy if they bear 100-fold fruit, right? So Jesus is extremely merciful, but you do need to be bearing fruit. Verse 29, he who eats drinks in an unworthy manner, irreverently, drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we need to be discerning what it is that Jesus <laughs> did. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you. And so to discern the Lord's body means, I gave you the de Greek definition, to separate thoroughly, to discriminate, which now you're not supposed to use that, unfortunately, the government, well, they're probably listening in on this, I don't know, but whatever. You know, so I go to prison for using the word discriminate. The Bible says discriminate. <laughs> Understand what it is that Jesus did when he came and suffered and bled and died and had his beat, beaten body so that our, by his stripes we could be healed and so on. Discriminate to decide to judge. Judge what it is that Jesus has done for you. And, and thank God every year, Hopefully we learn a little more than we knew the year before. And so we're building up an accumulation of knowledge and understanding of the horrendous suffering that Christ did because he loved us so much. John 3.16. Passover is where we should reverently come before God, mentally aware of the awesome sacrifice of Jesus our Lord, and also to memorialize his death. The Corinthians were taking Passover irreverently, leading to weakness, sickness, and death, and therefore growing weaker than at Passover rather than growing stronger. We all need to focus on the death of our Lord and to learn more about taking Passover with much adoration and reverence.